All right, and we're recording. So thank you all for joining for our 49th edition. The next one will be 50. We should do something special of the Service Fabric community Q&A with the Service Fabric team. Uh, we have Peter, Anthony, and others from the team. I'll go ahead and let you guys introduce the rest of the team. A uh, reminder for folks that this conversation is not under NDA. It's one of the few from the Azure Connection programs that will also be public. Um, it will be recorded. We are currently recording, and it will be shared later on. Um, the team will be managing the thread. Let us know if you have any questions throughout the session, and I'm sure there will be time at the end as well. Um, but Anthony, Peter, and team, I'll let you guys take it away. Uh, yeah, welcome to the 49th, uh, and thanks for reminding it. Next one is 50th, so we have to do some extra homework to make it special, I guess. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Nandini, and we have Peter and Mike from Service Fabric Product side, um, and have um, uh, the engineers Charles um, and Mang from the engineering side as well, who are going to uh, do some exciting, interesting uh, demos. Uh, so the agenda here is uh, going to be: uh, we're going to the first half hour. We're going to talk about uh, the public preview uh, um, offering of Azure Service Managed Clusters, where we um, take care of managing the cluster infrastructure and the operations for the service fabric cluster. Uh, and uh, we did a preview announcement uh, a week ago, um, and Peter did talk about it, um, uh, presented like last session, uh, last community call. So we will not go into the details of what it is, how it is, because there's a public doc out there. Um, and Peter, if you don't mind, I think it's already there in the community call blog post that I shared. If you don't mind putting the link again, Peter, that will be great. Um, and uh, we will start with a demo of the Service Fabric Managed Clusters, followed by uh, a demo from Charles about Fabric Observer and the latest improvements that he has done to the watchdog service that you can use to monitor the health of your nodes and uh, the cluster. Um, so I'll hand off to uh, Mung. Uh, so Peter, like I think I'll, let me hand it off to you and you can give some context and then uh, hand it off to Mung. Yeah, I think it's good to hand off to Mung. Thanks for the great introduction, Anthony. As you mentioned, we announced a public preview of Service Fabric Managed Clusters a few weeks ago now, and we're excited to show you a demo of some of the cluster operations and how we've made it easier to use. So I'll hand it off to Mung now to showcase that. Yeah. Hello, thanks, um, Peter. So actually, let me share my screen. I can I can share my screen, right? Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. You might want to just zoom in a little bit. You mean zoom in a little bit? Uh, yeah, the text is quite small right now, just to make oh. it a little bit easier to read. Mm. Better, but I think my screen. It is better. Um. Yeah, it's a little bit better. Yeah, OK, uh, let me get started. So just first, just a quick recap on uh, this offering, this new offering, uh, what do we call the managed clusters. So uh, what I'm showing currently is a existing uh, ARM template that you currently use to deploy a uh, service app across on Azure. And many of you might already know that if you look at the uh, template, it's, it's very complex. It has cross resource. But the cluster result doesn't really just give the cluster the cluster runs on the VM skill set and also needed the network, virtual network, load balance, a bunch of other stuff uh, to actually work. So when you deploy the template, you actually have uh, like the number of resources in your um, in your template in your load create cluster. Also include the certificate information. You have to make sure it's filled incorrectly in different places so that it can work all together, like the extension settings and uh, uh, VM settings. So whatever we, we what 
this this model uh, works fine, but we have seen uh, like number of issues when people need to make changes to the template. Uh, for example, certificate rotation or, or remove a no type. Uh, you have to make sure you do the correct steps. You also have to make sure that you uh, know where to make the changes. So a lot of people are finding um, it hard to actually do it right. So th in this new service model, we are trying to simplify this. Uh, you can see this is the template I'm showing, which is um, much, much shorter than the one you've seen earlier. And you can see you no, no longer have to deal with the load balance or the VNS and, and, and uh, VM skills and all the stuff. Uh, what you define in the templates is really just the resource of the magic clusters, and you define no types. No types are basically kind of like the node pools, uh, which behind the scene we created the VM skill set and all the balance and everything underneath, still in your subscription, but but not showing in the template. So you can so you don't have to worry about those um, setup of those complex uh, Azure resources underneath to support the cluster. You are being focused on really just define the cluster itself. And uh, later on, you can also use this uh, template to deploy, for example, your application uh, you, where you just focus more on your application deployment. This is the kind of the idea of the managed clusters. Uh, first, uh, let me just quickly deploy um, this template just to see how it works, and we can talk a little more while the deploying in, uh, in is ongoing. So, uh, I, yeah, yeah, I'm just going to deploy the template I currently shown here. You can see it find a magic class resource and then one node type for the magic classes, uh, which has like uh, five VM uh, with standard D2. So, we just do this really quick. Yeah, you can see uh, now the deployment started. I really skipped the value that I already have default values, so only specify the the um, the value that don't have a, um, a default value. Now you can see the 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 thing here is you can specify some basic information about the DNS name, which give you the load balancer. And you can also define the clients, which is the certificate that has the permission to access the cluster. And also the node node type you need to define basically the the VMs like what how uh, how much space you need for at the data disk and what the what the skill of the VM VM also what OS you want. Uh, in this case, the the what value I'm just using in the default value in the uh, in the template. So as the deployment to get started, uh, you will see uh, in the resource group that the service the new resource uh, what we call the server mesh cluster will be created. Let me also zoom in here. Just Yeah, and you can see this is the one that has the demo 20 that I just created where they are still being created. Yeah, we don't have full UI yet, so you only have like limited information uh, on portal, but uh, those will be available soon. Uh, so for the purpose of demo, I'm actually currently using a, a like different uh, tool to show some of the operations you can do on the um, uh, managed clusters. And you can see this is the tool that, that runs and basically pulls information from portal using the ARM API and you can see how things work um, and I show some of the operations uh, that we can do. Uh, so yeah, this is still deploying while we're waiting for this. Uh, on the quick skip to like, for example, one example of how we can simplify the operation you can do on the clusters. Uh, one thing you probably know is, for example, um, to remove a node type currently uh, there's a long document on, on, on uh, our Azure document website. Uh, for example, 
one of the common tasks people do is to remove no type and new one because you want to change some of the uh, VM skills or you want to change them properly that you can't change in place. Uh, there's a long list of steps you have to follow to do that. Uh, those are the correct steps, but like I said earlier, people just find it hard to follow and they really like to have a much simpler way to uh, manage this. Uh, with the new managed classes offering, you can see we are modeling each of the node type as the child resource. So we can use a simple command to actually delete the node type. I'm going to uh, demo this operation in one of the class that I created earlier. So you can see, for example, I have this demo twice uh, that I created earlier, which had two node type, one front end, one back end. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah, one's FF, one's BE. Uh, like, I'm going to show you how, for example, you can delete the uh, back end to be be no time with a simple command. You can use the regular simple command. Uh, let me stop this. This is a regular ARM uh, resource command to do that, or you can use the built-in um, the uh, Azure Service Fabric uh, ARM command to do that. So uh, let me also zoom in. Yeah, you can see uh, I'm, from, the, from now I'm just using the regular remote agent resource command uh, and the target to be removed is basically the magic class uh, demo twice, which is getting cluster and the no time backend. Um, you know, the in, in the document, one of the um, things that you do to uh, remove no type is first to deactivate the nodes, ensure nodes are not there and unmark the certain primary and, and also delete the uh, on the East VM still said deactivate the node, disable the node state, uh, remove the node state, and a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of basically a uh, number of steps. Uh, here we'll be doing those steps for you. You can see once I run this, uh, re remove Azure resource backend, the change the status of the backend should be deleting. And the first few things to do is first disable the node. Uh, you can see the states, the nodes are not currently being disabled. Once they are disabled, uh, we'll do the next step to delete the VM skill set. Uh, to start class upgrade to remove the reference from a class. We're basically doing everything uh, all time here in the document, uh, but without you having to do that. So um, this will also take a minute, but you can see the node is already down because we have deactivated the nodes, uh, the VM now are being deleted. And in few moments, in few moments when the, the VM is deleted, uh, you can see the class upgrade will start and then the uh, this node type will be removed from the class resource, from this, this class resource. And then let's go back also to the uh, actual demo. You can see this, this is uh, the class has been created, but it's still waiting for nodes. And then the VM are now being created. Um, again, this is the the the, the 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 create class operation I performed earlier. Uh, they are still running. Um, you can also do other operations. Um, we have a so in fact we have added the commands in the uh, Azure Service Fabric um, PowerShell. Not the um, service uh, data plane PowerShell, but the uh, Azure service fabric PowerShell. You can see there's a number of uh, commands that start with managed clusters. So manage cluster, add managed cluster VM extension, uh, add uh, including some of the operations like restart the node type. I'm going to, want to show like a quick demo. So for example, if we want to restart a node in the node type. Uh, what you can do, you basically can use this command. So I'm going to do this. So, let's see if we're going to restart the command from the SC demo 10 cluster. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, this also will take a few seconds to complete. But what you observe is basically will do, like you can see, this now change the display state uh, to evacuate the node when this is finished. Hello. Yep, we can still hear you, man. Okay. Uh, thought we might run a lot of time. So when this is complete, we can see the node will actually be shut down, uh, and then the VM be restarted. Then when the restart finish, the VM will come back and node become reactive again. So yeah, again, this will take some minutes to uh, complete, but you can see this is already started. And what you need to do is is just run this simple command. It will be kind of orchestrated underneath uh, process to make sure that you are restarting the VM in in a safe manner. And, and back to the one that's been creating, this is still creating. Yes, sometimes the VM creation can be a little slow, but back to one that we were trying to delete the uh, node type, you can see that the VM is already gone. Uh, the node has been shut down, and then this is the last step, which we are seeing a cluster upgrade uh, to actually remove the node type reference from the cluster manifest. Once all the things are finished, this will be uh, disappearing from the this UI, which means that the node type is actually deleted. Yeah, this is the restart operation. You can see the cluster is uh, the node is not being shut down. Uh, once we come back, that means the VM is being restarted. This basically this restart. You can see the this little progress bar that's that's moving. Uh, once the VM is restarted, it will come back and then we'll make sure the node is activated. Uh, we'll come back as enabler status and then they will be up. Yeah, Pete, I think that's about it. I think we'll, I'm already using about 20 minutes. Um, awesome. Yeah, that was yeah I don't have to wait up. because this will still take a moment to finish, but you can see how the things work, uh, how things have been simplified by like, for example, just running a simple command and that the magic class that the service fabric RP will be oxygen the actually needed to simplify the matching experience. Yeah, I'm gonna stop my sharing now because I think we are already um, to the miss into the meeting. Peter, is that okay? Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks so much, Mung. Uh, we yeah. have one question in the chat from you, which is: yeah, sure. Will data storage to temp disk be supported in managed clusters? As I understand, temp disks should have performance and cost advantages in high transaction scenarios. Yeah, not yet. Uh, I think we have discussed about this. We currently don't have a plan to support that. We might need to support that in some of the skills with the larger uh, the NVMe discs, but currently those are not yet uh, in our plan. Yes, yeah. I, I think there's one more question. Yeah. Uh, yes, those are still visible. So these are very similar to the ATS cluster. So yeah, I should have mentioned this. When you create a cluster, you will actually see a new resource group created in a portal. So outside from the one that that I show in my um, uh, in my demo that you see a match class resource created in the resource group we're doing, you'll also see a, a different resource group that are created, which is hosting all the underlying resources for this cluster. So yes, they are still visible. Does anyone have any other questions on the demo itself or want to know more about this offering? So there's one more question, Peter. Are the scale sets, um, sets, et cetera, still vi visible? Yeah, in so uh, uh, Mung actually just answered this question, but as Mung like was saying, you can still see the resource group where the different scale sets and certificates are located. Yeah. Thanks. I think the uh, they've done now. Uh, Mung and Peter have done the team. Entire team has done a great job with the documentations and samples. And uh, it also there's also a recorded demo of uh, a smaller scale version of what Manga showed the public docs. So we encourage you to try it and give us feedback. 
Um, if there's no more questions, I think we should, uh, in the interest of time, let Charles uh, dive into Fabric Observer. Thank you, Mang, for the demo. All right, thank you. Charles? Greetings. There's actually another question from Wit. Oh. Um, that should be answered. Can uh, you see can, it? Yeah. Oh, I just oh. saw it. I just, there was a. Can SF adapt to you changing the BMSS sets in the portal without having to resubmit a specific command to handle? Um, for example, if you manually scale a BMSS up, Will SF easily adapt as it normally does now? So actually, no. You, we uh, export, will export those operations uh, in the magic class concept. So just like a template, you should be working at the node type level. So you don't manually skew a VM skill set. You don't uh, normally need to act, uh, come into the VM the underneath resource group and, and make changes there. Instead, you should change the node count, the node type in the template or through the portal UI, which I will have a better uh, scaling UI for that. So uh, and then we'll do the underneath because when you, for example, adjust the VM skill set, you also need to adjust some of the cluster settings in some cases. So those things are being encapsulated. So basically the short answer is that uh, you do not go there and directly make a change to the VM skill set. Uh, we'll explore those operations and node type resource level. So you actually working with the node type to, for example, changing the, uh, the instance count and the search. Um, there's another question on concept of managed classes is nice, but I feel the features need to be expanded for it to be truly useful, but I'm sure it's all under work. Um, yeah, we, we still have a list of features that have been added. Also, yeah. if you have any feedback, like you have features that feel are missing uh, and an important scenario for you, feel free to get the feedback to us. So we're also just making sure that we get those done. I think we have one more question. Would there be uh, locks in the portal or something similar to yeah, prevent? Would there be this? locks in the portal or something similar to prevent accidental changes? Uh, not yet. This has been asked for us, the ARM team, but I think they have other considerations. So currently you still have like right access to resource. So uh, we also were talking about adding some warnings or just adding some messages because that resource group will be uh, matched by another resource. If you look at, if you pull up the resource group through the uh, Azure CLI with a list of words, you can see this managed by attribute, which kind of indicate this resource group is managed by another resource to support that resource. Uh, we have under some discussion, but maybe at least showing some warning message, uh, but that's that's not there as of today. Um, I, I know there, uh, there are, this is great feedback. Uh, thanks for all the questions and the feedback so far. And uh, obviously we uh, have, uh, we are working towards the GA goal with more uh, enriched features. So Mike from our team has posted a GitHub projects link uh, where we have uh, uh, presented like our roadmap to GA for this service ma fabric managed clusters, what is coming in the pipeline and uh, what are our um, f towards GA. So uh, please take a look at that. Um, and again, like explore, try the samples, try the demo and uh, give us feedback. Um, I don't see any more questions. I don't think I missed any uh, any other questions. Okay, so should we move on? I think I think this is like, one I more question. I don't question, see any questions. But, but and uh, think... thanks, Wang. Uh, All right, thank you. Do you want to take control, Charles? Sure. Uh, greetings, everyone. So yeah, I mean, Wit had a question, but it's sort of a generic question about uh, exposing plans in GitHub um, roadmaps and stuff, which seems to be something Mike would be working on. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, how many folks out here uh, on this call have used fabric observer or experimented with it anyone okay uh so oh yeah great raise hand awesome 
CD, right on. So there's been a fair number of changes um, over the last time I discussed this uh, in a setting like this. As you can see, um, the uh, sort of the, the way that we've developed um, Traffic Observer has been completely in the open, right? So there's a develop branch and there's a master branch. In develop, you'll see there's kind of churn there sometimes because we're kind of updating, fixing bugs, um, adding new features, reflecting on features that are there, and perhaps either modifying them or improving them. And what we don't do is sort of break backwards compatibility. And if we do have a breaking change, obviously, we make that very clear uh, in the releases. Uh, but anyway, just for those who haven't seen this, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I guess screen one will be the right one. Um, and I'll show you sort of, where are we? Here we are. So it's obviously a GitHub repo. Um, yes, uh, to the question, it's a variant of a watchdog. Um, we use the name observers because these are passive in the sense that, um, you know, we don't basically scream and bark and yell and do whatever. But basically the idea is um, we have this collection. So first of all, I'll step back. So Fabric Observer is a service fabric application, right? It's built on entirely public APIs. Um, but the concept is that uh, provides users with a really granular way of expressing um, what matters to you and what you want to be watched. So obviously there's the canonical stuff with like, you know, node pressure, disk pressure, stuff like that. But you can also get down to sort of the application service level, right? And a lot of times you get, you run into issues where, for example, one of your services uh, so one of the you know processes uh, that belong to an application is you know maybe leaking ports, meaning it's just opening a bunch of ports. Maybe it's in the ephemeral the ephemeral range, so the dynamic port range. Um, and you know we typically what happens is we you don't know about it until bad things start to happen. So if, if ports aren't available, then service fabric is unhappy, Windows is unhappy, things start going wrong. And so what you can do is sort of have this preemptive sort of thing where you say, hey, if any of the services of this app type uh, have opened more than, you know, a thousand ports, um, I want a warning. And that warning means and maps to a warning in SFX. Uh, and also it's very easy to configure service fabric, fabric observer to emit telemetry. Um, it supports, uh, implements event source based tracing, log analytics, and application insights. Those are super simple to configure. Application insights, log analytics, you provide your keys and your, you know, maybe two things. Um, and then automatically you'll start seeing things show up uh, in your diagnostics back end in your workspaces. So you can start to configure things like alerts. So you can see stuff in SFX. Uh, because what what Fabric Observer does ultimately is it generates health reports, uh, and these health reports will put the cluster into warning or error depending upon how you set up Service Fabric. So you can look at an, and the other thing I'll stop there and just sort of you know some of the new features that came in 3.0 um, is that. Fabric Observer is a .NET Core application, .NET Core 3.1, uh, and it works on Windows and Linux, right? So here we are running in Linux, and you can see OS Observer is doing its thing. OS Observer is quite useful because you can get a quick glance at sort of the state of the operating system, right? How many ports are open, number of processes, um, What's the memory situation on the node, right? What's the disk situation on the node? You just in a quick glance, you can get this information. Um, and over on Windows world, it's pretty much the same thing, except one of the differences, and pretty much the only difference, is that there's no, you know, the hot patches and fixes 
that you can see like in Windows, sometimes something might happen to a node and you might ask yourself, why was why did the node go down? Well, it could be that there was an update. You can click on the link and see what the update was. Um, so blah, blah, blah. And then in Linux world, uh, we have a slight difference in Fabric System Observer. Fabric System Observer is an observer that manages the physical resource use or abuse of the uh, system services, right? So on this particular version of Linux, uh, excuse me, of um, uh, Service Fabric, uh, we have leaky system services. We've identified the bug. In fact, Fabric Observer detected the bug, but we've identified the bug, we fixed the bug, so the bug doesn't exist in the latest release, so you don't have to worry about that for your Linux users. But you can see that it does a, you know, we a kind of by default Fabric Observer running on Linux, Fabric System Observer will show you how much memory, you know, Fabric's using Gateway where there's a known leak and Fabric Host as well. Um, and again, as I mentioned, those fix, but it's been very useful for uh, testing this thing, which I'm not going to really talk about today, but I will in a future um, conversation. So. Let's take a look at um, another really important feature, and I think pretty much the the one of the biggest features that was enabled by um, uh, moving to .NET Core, right? So first of all, .NET Core definitely is the future of .NET. Um, it's where a lot of the investment is, and it totally makes sense, and it just keeps getting better and better. Um, in this particular version, uh, it really enabled us to build a uh, plugin model, right? So you can write your own observers. Um, it may be that there's an observer that you need or behavior that you need or this level of observation that you want that you can plug into uh, all of the other stuff that Fabric Observer does for you, right? Generate health reports, uh, easy to configure telemetry, supporting multiple diagnostic backends, et cetera, et cetera. You can just focus on writing your own observer. And the way that uh, the Fabric Observer code base is designed is that any plugin can access all of the utility capabilities that any built-in observer uh, can access, right? So what I'm showing you on the screen right now is Container Observer. This is an observer that's actually quite useful because App Observer, for example, only cares about process level surfaces, uh, services. And what I mean is, as you all know, um, in, in sort of the canonical service fabric world, uh, an application service is a process, right? And in the containerized world, it's in our, you know, in service fabric, it's a Docker container that's being managed by a Docker runtime. Right, so the Docker D daemon. And so there's differences. App Observer can't really poke in and figure out anything about containers. It only understands the process level uh, applications or application services. And so Container Observer is actually needed. And it's a beautiful example of taking uh, a real need and extending Fabric Observer by using the plugin model. So it's it's a it's a simple observer. I mean, there's like I mean, you know, 400 500 lines of code. But the thing that it does is like um fat, like uh, for example um, app observer. The way that app observer and container observer work from a configuration perspective is it's JSON, right? And the reason it's JSON is because you can target a number of apps with a number of properties. And if this were to be XML, it would be excruciatingly ugly and complex. And so JSON makes it really simple because these are just, you know, an array of objects. And so in this particular case, you can see I've configured Container Observer to monitor uh, an application called Fabric Container Foo and another one called Fabric Container Foo 2. And the only things today that Container Observer does is monitor CPU use and memory use. And in particular, CPU percentage, um, and so CPU time, percent of CPU time over time, and then uh, the amount of megabytes of memory for a private working set. 
Now, for those of you that are Docker container people, you can quickly see that that maps to what Docker stats returns, right? So basically what this observer does is you can say, look, I want to watch all of the containers of type of that live under fabric container foo so for example fabric container foo 2 is actually a service that has or an application that has two containerized services and so for either of those if any of them hit 10 percent, i want a warning if either of them eat 50 megabytes of, of working set i want a warning right so the typical kind of watchdoggy stuff um, what's also really cool about the the, the plugin model is You'll see here, um, I'll actually come here real quickly um, and kind of show you today the way this works, right? So today the way this works is you'll notice in the releases section uh, on the repo, um, there's a bunch of assets. The ones that obviously matter for plugins are the new PKGs, right? These are packages, new get packages. And so you'll see that there's framework dependent uh, and they're also OS specific and then there's self-contained. And the if you're using an Azure image, right? So in other words, you've created a scale set from VMSS, for example, of some of Ubuntu 18.04 or Windows Server 2019 data center. Um, those don't have 3.1 on board .NET Core. So you're, you you want the self-contained. This, for those of you that know .NET core -y stuff, you've seen this before. You can build self-contained or framework dependent. Framework dependent means everything in this package expects on the target server that 3.1 has been installed. Self-contained means all of the binaries required to run the run .NET Core, all the libraries, et cetera, are included in the package and so it doesn't actually need to be installed on the target server obviously the cost is size right for obvious reasons and so when you build a plugin you first figure out okay i'm targeting windows for example uh, and so what i will do is i'll create a new uh, .NET Core library project, right? Because these are DLLs. So a container, uh, a plugin in Service Fabric world, in Fabric Observer world, is a DLL, right? So it's a library. Uh, it's a .NET Core library, and it implements a simple little startup interface. This is required. Uh, obviously, we're depend, we're using dependency injection here. And so what happens in Fabric Server, in Fabric Observer, when it first runs, um, it will look in a plugins folder, so data plugins and config, um, sort of in package root. And it will make sure that <clears throat> A, that a DLL that's in that folder uh, implements this interface. And secondly, uh, it's of type observer base. Um, and so this is always required to have this. It's in the documentation as well on uh, the Fabric Reserver site. And so then you basically will just simply add the package uh, for your target uh, of interest. Uh, again, self-contained if you're using a default Azure Gallery image for the virtual machine. Um, and you can then start programming away, right? And so in this case, um, you know, I'm using a built-in convenience type, uh, which is Fabric Resource Users Data. Um, basically, it's either a, um, a collection. Uh, so it's a, basically, it has to. Have, it has a property that's a numeric type. It's either going to be a list of some numeric type, or a circular buffer collection, um, because it could be you want to use a circular buffer collection if, for example. You want to like have a really long monitor duration and you don't want to just fill the list up endlessly with these numbers. You're really only interested in point in time sort of, you know, 50 or 40 or 30. And so circular buffer, what it does is it's only going to add that number of uh, items over time into a basically an I list. Uh, in this case, actually, it's a. Uh, you can see in the source code, it's a circular buffer implementation. Uh, 
And it can be of any type, right? It can be a double, int, long, whatever. Uh, but it needs to be numeric, otherwise it isn't very useful. And so, you know, what this does, I think one of the cool things about this is it, it kind of shows uh, one of the hardest problems to solve in this particular observer was how do you get the container ID um, for a uh, fabric observer containerized application instance, service instance. And the fact is we don't today support giving you that information. But because of the way we name these containers, we can figure out, okay, so as part of the name, you see this really long, nasty name. Part of that is actually the service, acti uh, service package activation ID. And so from the service package activation ID, um, you can basically go and grab uh, all of the deployed code packages and then figure out um, <clears throat> using that information um, you can see uh, I'm actually doing stuff by parsing uh, output from console commands um, but to make a long story short uh, given that information given the information that docker stats returns because there's always a container ID in that list you can look at the name and then from that you can say okay so what line has that container id in it based on the name that is the surface package activation id um, and blah 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 so that's how i get the container id um, i think one of the other cool things to talk about um, today with a few more minutes left is one of the things that um, is really important when you run um, you know any service in linux uh, is don't run as root, right? It's it's always a really bad idea to run as root. You know, arguably it's the same on Windows. Um, I would argue that root is much more devastating than admin on Windows, but you know that's up for another debate. Nevertheless, they're both not really the best kind of things, particularly in the case of Linux. Um, and so what we did is we came up with a methodology to enable running elevated stuff on Linux from a normal user process. And this is because Linux actually, uh, I think since kernel for something, um, introduced this, this capability called, well, capabilities. And so capabilities enable you to um, really granularly say things like, um, you know, add capabilities to this binary. So in our case, we created a custom binary. It's a simple C file that basically will run, it sets capabilities on the binary inside of it. It says this binary is gonna need this set of capabilities. Uh, and then uh, from a service fabric perspective, um, we run a setup script as root that will set the capabilities on that binary that the binary has said it supports that are in sort of the capability sets. To make a long story short, this binary only does one thing, right? So in the case of elevator Docker stats, this binary will only uh, call Docker stats no stream. That's it. That's all it can do, right? And it runs as a non-elevated user in Linux, and this is an elevated command to call Docker stats on Linux. It's a root level command. And so it's actually kind of a nifty way that we can run Fabric Observer as a normal user and do today two things uh, and only two things in two different binaries that are capability laced um, in a in a relatively safe way, right? Because an attacker is not going to do much with this with this information because we're not like exposing running this entire service as root. Now that said. The final thing I'll talk about from a security perspective is that in service fabric, the cluster is the security boundary, right? And so um, this is just extra precaution, uh, in particular in the case of Linux, because you know you should really be careful with uh, using being root Linux, being adding fabric reserver to like um, you know running as in the pseudo group or whatever, or adding you know, like Docker <clears throat> to be running in the pseudo, uh, I can't remember exactly the other solution, but there's, those are like hammer solutions. 
capabilities is a much more elegant and secure way uh, of really scoping um, root level cap uh, needs uh, and basically calls to files uh, uh, in a highly granular way. So I recommend people look into that if you run it even your your daily work if you're trying to figure out security on Linux for certain things where you don't necessarily want to run what you're doing, like your services as root and because you, you only say needed to make one call that made you run your service as root, uh, check out Linux capabilities. Anyway, so basically, you know, with Fabric Observer uh, today, um, you can also grab SFPKGs, which are, as you know, you know, an SFPKG is a file folder structure that our deployer expects. Um, it's just a zip file. We rename it to SFPKG. Um, all of these contain Microsoft signed binaries. Um, and that's that. I One of the work items is to get this kind of thing like on NuGet. Um, the final thing I'll show you in the case of like Container Observer is when we build this, a couple things happen. Um, there's, uh, you know, some post build kind of stuff you put on here. So we could like, for example, take this, you can add your own um, settings, right? So as you know, uh, in the 3.0, one of the cool things that people have been asking for for app for fabric observer was the ability to do runtime updates to parameters and not have to do a complete redeployment because you decided you want to disable app observer or you wanted to enable fabric system observer or you wanted to change some values for say node observer right um, this can all be done with application parameters um, in very simple way like this where you can see in my Linux cluster, I want to say increase uh, when to warn, when Fabric System Observer should warn in terms of memory. And then I would simply call the start service route application upgrade, pass it app parameters, uh, the right version of uh, the service fabric that's currently executing, uh, and obviously the name of the application, and then this would start a parameter update um, for the currently executing Fabric Observers on all of the nodes. So Fabric Observer is a uh, stateless uh, minus one service, runs on every node. Any instance of Fabric Observer only knows about its surrounding machine. It doesn't care about any other uh, instance of Fabric Observer running in the cluster. Uh, and its main goal is to focus and hone in on uh, machine level resources um, and giving you the ability to configure it uh, to warn or error depending upon what you need. Um, and I kind of went all over the place, but my assumption for this was that people have at least heard about this. So um, now we can take questions right on. So I heard a while back, oh, I think that's something else. Uh, performance, I think that's for a different question. Uh, are observers usable? On, yes. Um, so are observers usable on a stand on standalone clusters? Sure. Um, are there limitations? Um, I can't think of any limitations. I mean, um, no, there's no limitations because there's not like an auto update going on. So the if you have a standalone cluster, um, it's really no different than a non standalone cluster as far as Fabric Observer is concerned. Um, is there some sort of sync? available to which application instances can write out to these observers, e.g. to surface critical errors, it's otherwise writing to a log. Um, so today what happens is um, if a threshold is breached, right, 
which means like either it's re reached or um, or exceeded. Um, whatever happens has been designated. Um, so the default behavior is it will put the cluster into warning um, with a very specific message, right? So this, you know, basically there's two types of um, health reports and only two that Fabric Observer emits or generates. One is an application level health report. And in the description, which by the way, is a serialized instance of telemetry data type, will have all the information about that particular warning. You know, the replica, the replica ID, the um, partition ID, the service instance, the metric, the metric value, the node name, all that information, the warning uh, message, will all be in that message, uh, in that serialized instance of this type. And then that will, you, you can configure it to emit that to whatever your telemetry backend is, right? So that can go to your log analytics, that can go to wherever. As far as showing up in the portal, um, that depends on what the portal can show. I mean, the portal can show you that your cluster is in warning or error, obviously. Um, whether or not it takes health report data and can show that to you, frankly, I don't know the answer. Well, um, okay, I, I guess to, to kind of clarify the question here, um, yeah. you know, right, right now the, the portal, you know, through the health reports can tell you things about the architecture of, you know, wherever you've got in your cluster. It can tell you about here the application types and, you know, say, hey, you know, your certificates are going to expire in a month or, you know, what have you. Mm -hmm. They, but... Yeah, it seems like the watchdog is, or I'm sorry, the the observers are kind of similar to that and saying, let me tell you a little bit more in more detail about the different application types. Uh, is there any way to take information from within the application types themselves and allow them to write out to these health reports as well via the observer? So if, if, you know, if the observer is watching here, uh, you mm -hmm. know, is, do I have any way of saying, you know, something critical has happened right now, and I want to surface that in a health report and say something bad has happened to this application type uh, that's, you know, necessitated a restart or something rather in a way that's potentially more accessible than just dumping it into the logging system and finding that through some other tool. Um, so if I understand your question correctly, I mean, um, l let me kind of, try to explain the so in your scenario right let's say you have configured um and i will show this while so people can see uh some nifty samples um let's see there we go um let's say you have a world where uh you know when i think type so let's say that you've configured fabric observer Again, I'm not sure that Fabric Observer really is more of a um, you've asked me to do something and I'm going to do it for you, right? So you've so for example, in what you're looking at here, I've asked Fabric Observer to monitor CPU memory net ports um, for uh, every service that belongs to the application of my app type. So any application of type my app type. Uh, any of its services except for some service 42 and some service 43. I want warnings when they're eating 40 percent uh, CPU, 30 percent of memory, 80 active ports, 40 of, of them being ephemeral, right? So, 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 so this is looking a lot more at the, you know, the, the application itself is its own black box still but you know dealing with how exactly it's interacting with the service at fabric infrastructure itself you know from mm -hmm. from port usage and whatnot mm -hmm. so it's, exactly. it's not trying to get into how the application itself is working this is no. just uh helping from the uh i guess the orchestration side well yeah so for example an application okay. so a service fabric application really isn't doing isn't a thing right it's a it's a sort of this uh abstraction of a collection of services and configurations of versioned right so your application is a thing 
in terms of the being like this, the structure that's composed of n number of services, right? And then you have the services are the things that are actually computing, they're executing on the machine. And so Fabric Observer is interested in the things that are computing that are bound to some app container. In other words, not, not in the container sense. So in this example, you could have n numbers of applications that are of my app type that have n number of services that are actually executing on the machine. And so what Fabric Observer cares about is what's the, the sort of computational side effect, if you will, of these services? How much CPU are they using? How much memory are they using? How many ports are they opening? How many connections do they have open? Um, and then you as the uh, most important piece of the puzzle can configure this to say, um, if any of these, except for these two, are using this much of that, this much of this, then I want a warning. And again, the warning itself is going to show up in Service Fabric. So, uh, you know, you can see examples of what this would look like. Um, uh, actually, I can, we're running out of time, and I, I could show you happening in real time, but you know, in Windows cluster, I should have some events um, that I can show you output. Um, this looks like one. Perfect. So here's a case where Node Observer, and Node Observer, as far as Node Observer is concerned, Node means virtual machine. I realize that Node is an overloaded term. In this case, Node Observer only cares about the virtual machine, doesn't care about the fabric node. Right. I mean, it, what I mean, so it's focusing on what's going on on the virtual machine. And so in this case, it was detected that the virtual machine was consuming 91% of all available CPU, uh, all available CPU, not, not just one or two or whatever, all. Uh, and so what happens is because it was configured to warn actually when it, when it hits 80%, uh, you can see this serialized instance of telemetry data uh, with the useful information. So it detected that it was actually eating this much. And so I'm emitting a warning. And so this could be emitted to, uh, it puts the uh, node in warning itself, if you look at in the cluster. So in this case, um, the node SF5 would be yellow. And of course, the cluster would be yellow as well. Um, and then... Uh, that's sort of what it looks like in the kind of data kind of way. Uh, and the reason that these is a serialized instance of telemetry is because this is used by other things that run in the cluster. For example, cluster observer. Cluster observer can deserialize this into an actual type and it sort of inspects stuff on it and then emit telemetry itself. For example, if you have cluster observer, which just does sort of higher level evaluations of what's going on from, you know, the cluster, regardless of whether or not Fabric Observer is there, in terms of emitting uh, health reports to some external telemetry uh, backend. Cool. Anyway, I think I'm I'm no, going over you. time. Yeah, uh, and I'll answer a few more questions. Oh yeah, let's see. We should probably take the end of this to kind of deal with any questions that's been asked that's related to anything. Um, how would you choose, how how would you observe the health state of a certain service based on custom criteria? Would you need to expose some kind of ping health API from that service? So that's a great question. If, if say for example, um, you're interested in, uh, for example, like when I was explaining container plugin, none of the current existing plugins our observers solve the container observation problem. And so the way that you would do this is you would just write another observer. Now, of course, you could go into the Fabric Observer source code, you could clone it, and you could modify an observer to do what you wanted. But by enabling you to uh, basically just write your own observer and simply deploy Fabric Observer from that project, which is something I was gonna explain, but I don't wanna, like, I think we're way over time, so. 
But the last thing I would say is that when, as I was mentioning, when you build a container observer, you basically get a decompressed SFPKG, right? And you can just deploy it um, right from your output directory. Uh, and that becomes your deployment of Fabric Observer, uh, but also, um, so for example, oh, I was going to do something else on this one. So in some sense, um, well, let me just do this. Since I have this open, I can turn and there this was one back more, on. Charles, just real quick. <laughs> There was one where FG posted he couldn't see the events in SFX. I couldn't um, see. Is there? Do you see anything uh, with that? Linux or Windows? Give me a question back to him. FG, if you hear that, if you're still here. Windows. So you couldn't see health events from Fabric Observer in Windows? Yeah, we may want more information there offline. Yeah. Well, here's an example. Yeah, please get in touch with me offline, but. Um, uh, it, it should show up. Yeah, it could be your setup. I mean, depending upon what you're doing. So, for example, and what version you're using, uh, those are important. Um, but if it, if it, typically, if Fabric Observer detects that a threshold has been breached, there will be a warning. And in Windows, that's also going to be uh, something that shows up in Event Store. On Linux, there is no event store, so it won't show up there. 7.1 refresh 4. Yeah, I, don't, I, I need a bit more information, but you can contact me offline. Yeah, we're at 3.0.8, but that shouldn't have made any difference. The last two changes weren't haven't, weren't dramatic. Um, uh, I will uh, feel free to reach out to me directly to ctori at microsoft.com. So, um, I can just put my email here. So that's my alias, and you can put at Microsoft.com on it. Feel free to send me an email. Um, any other questions? All right, and I think we're, Monty, but okay. we're over time. Yeah. yeah, we're way over time. Hey, guys, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm sorry if I kind of went all over the place, but there's a ton of documentation uh, on the website and you can read it uh, and you have my email address. You can always just send me an email. Awesome. And so, yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap it up for now then. Thank you all the team, Chris, Meg, Peter, Anthony, everyone, as always the service fabric team for everything. A couple things folks, before you hop off, uh, I posted two links there in the chat. One is to the idea survey for topics for the next call. So whatever you guys want to hear about in the next call, go ahead and drop it there so that we know we can address those things in the next one. And of course, there's a 30 second feedback survey on this particular session. If you found it useful or if you think there's ways that we can make it even better, go ahead and let us know. Uh, thank you all for joining again. We're super excited for the 50th, which will be next month. It's been an, an awesome ride for sure. Um, Chris and team, I'll go ahead and let you wrap it up and then we'll end the recording there. I'm sorry, Charles. I think I said Chris. <laughs> Charles, yeah, no. Team, apologies. <laughs> I would just say, I would just say, you know, check out the amazing work that Ma you know Meng and team have done um, with managed clusters, man. And Fabric Reserver obviously will work in managed clusters, but like, I highly recommend you check out that highly uh, the work that they've done. Um, and also, from a Fabric Reserver perspective, try it out write your own observer uh, if they don't work for you. Um, and also please provide feedback, generate bugs on the GitHub repo, ask for, for features there as well, um, and have fun and learn about what's actually going on in your cluster. Awesome. Thank you again, Charles and Service Fabric team. Thank you everyone for joining and we look forward to seeing you in the community and also in the next one, which will be our 50th. So. Thank you all again and again, and hope to see you soon. Cheers.